Hey, if you guys have a, your Bibles with you or a copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn in there to Luke chapter 2. Turn there in Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Luke 2, verse 19. I'm only going to read just a little bit of it, okay? But I'm going to ask if you would, if you're physically able to stand while we read God's Word together, collectively, okay? Luke 2, verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, in prayer. God, I pray we we come in this room, we come here today because we are looking for you. And we need you. Perhaps that some way along the way in our lives, God, we have, we've lost you. We've lost sight of you. And we've come in here trying to find you. And Lord, I pray that you would be true to your word, that those who seek find. And God, that you would use today to inspire us to seek you in so many ways, Lord, and to find you in your word, in prayer and through serving. I pray, God, that you would grant me the gifts of teaching and preaching. Those are heavenly gifts that I do not have and that just must come from you, Lord. Anything that I have on this page or anything that I would say is weak and fruitless and in vain without your spirit and without you giving the gift, I pray that we would receive it. For the glory of your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Um, she was the final piece to the puzzle that he had been collecting for the last three years. He had been tracking down people all over the place that were a part of this amazing story. All of his examining, all of his inquiry, all of his probing, all of his fact-finding had taken him on quite the eclectic journey. From skyscraper cities to small towns that didn't even have a stoplight in it. From scenic mountaintops to smelly seashores to lavish palaces to leper colonies. He had listened to testimony from a lot of different people too. From all walks of life, he had listened to prisoners and priests. He had listened to shepherds and senators, the devout and the doubter. If they were mentioned in the story he was investigating, he had found them and he had listened to them. He had sat down with them. If he was going to write his orderly account of everything, he would need them. But before he could begin writing, he needed the beginning. And she was the one who knew it. And after some searching, he found her living in her husband, the home that her husband had built for them when they were engaged almost 70 years ago. After some knocking on the rough cut wood door, the old lady opens the door slowly and he says, Hello, ma'am. My name's Luke. Most people just call me Doc. I know that you don't know me, but I sure have heard a whole lot about you. I've talked with Peter, I've talked with John, I've talked with the others, and they have told me all about your son, and ma'am, that's why I'm here. I'm writing sort of a biography about his life. Do you mind if I come in and talk to you? She welcomed him in and offered him a seat at the kitchen table. She gave him a glass of water and she sits there as he nervously tries to find his pen and pad that he had been writing everything down on. And she says, now, what is it that you want to know, Dr. Luke? You know, I've got a lot of things that I could say about this and about him. And he says, yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot that you could say. And as he finds his pen and pad, he begins to ask her some questions. He says, look, he said, I've heard a lot about your son. I've read most of the things about him. I've followed this story personally very closely from a long time. I've even talked to your other son, James. I've talked to some of his closest friends. And I have talked to countless people who have encountered your son, Jesus, who have been affected by him in their lives. I talked to one man that Jesus healed from leprosy, another one that was paralyzed and with a word he could walk, a centurion who said that Jesus had saved his servant 
at a distance. I talked to another person who said that, or as a mother and a son, that said that he was dead and in his casket, and your son walked by and touched it, and he came out of it. I talked to another man named Jairus that said the same thing happened with his daughter. I talked to a man that was blind that he gave sight. I talked to a lady who had been bleeding for decades and decades, and with the touch of your son's robe, it stopped. I talked to a younger, uh, or talked to a man who said when he was a young boy, he gave your son Jesus some lunch of his, and he fed a mountainside full of people with it. I talked to a Roman soldier who said he was there the very minute that your son died, and I have talked with countless people that have said that they saw your son Jesus walking around even after he was dead. I've got all this information, but what I need is something that can only come from you. You're the only one who can tell this. How did it all begin? You're the only one who was there at the beginning. I've heard rumors. I've heard stories. I've heard all these things that are floating around, but I need to hear it from you, Mary. And Mary says to him, you sure you want to Testimony from a woman. You know that ours isn't even valid in court. Isn't this going to hurt you, Luke, getting a testimony from me? And Luke says, I want the truth, ma'am. I want, no, I need to know what happened, when it happened, and exactly how it happened. And so she smiles, and she leans in at Luke, and she begins to tell him the story. It begins with my cousin, Elizabeth, and her husband in the days of Herod when he was ruler of Judea. And from there, for the next few hours, Luke listens to the most remarkable story from the most remarkable lady that he had ever met. And it was something that was really unbelievable. But coming from her, he believed every word. Coming from her, the one that was there, he took everything as truth. And this story had all the elements of the unbelievable. It had all the elements of the remarkable. It was angels coming to earth, barren women giving birth, night skies opening up to heavenly hosts, sinister villains desiring to destroy the innocent, the low and the poor, the uneducated, bowing down with the wise and the wealthy. But none of these things were impressive. None of these things or what would make a reader's jaw drop. None of these things would give goosebumps to the audience. What was so extraordinary was the unthinkable had occurred. What was so hard to believe was that this was something that was unbelievable. God can do big things. He can do the things that a God can do. Parting seas, no problem. Covering, or covering the world with floods, speaking a mountain into existence or a star. That was child's play for a God. God can do big things, but God doing something so small, how could that happen? The voice that flung the stars into existence can make a baby's cry. How could this be? The hands that withheld constellations in its palm could reach for the face of a teenage mother. How could this be? God stepping off the throne and into a womb of a woman from Nazareth? This is beyond belief, but God did it. Luke sat there in front of her. The woman whose womb bore the wonder of the universe sat three feet across the table from Dr. Luke. He watched her eyes, even 70 years later, fill up with awe when she told the story of Elizabeth's child leaping in the womb when she approached. Her voice began to rise when she told the story of shepherds coming to see her baby boy, talking of stories of heavenly host and magi coming from the east and bowing down before her baby. She told the story, and Luke felt the joy and the pain and the sorrow when she would pause and say, And I treasured up and pondered all of these things in my heart. Luke asked her what she meant by that. And she said, you see, Luke, from the mountain or from the manger to that mountain in Calvary, I was his mother. I was his mother. I was there every day. I pondered and I balanced how this Jesus would become what Gabriel said he would become. You see, Gabriel told me that he would 
be great that he would rule the house of Israel forever. And Luke, I know what that meant. I've read my Bible. I've read the scripture. I knew that this son, my baby, would grow up and be a man and he would be despised and rejected. He would be called a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that my son would be a son of suffering, that he would be afflicted. He would be pierced, crushed, chastised, and wounded. Isaiah told us that about my baby boy. It was difficult for me to balance and even understand what it meant to be his servant and yet be his mother. I loved him as my child, and I also loved him as my Lord. Yes, from the manger to the mountain, Luke, I loved him. I can remember laughing inside of myself when I rubbed his tiny fingers together, and I held them, and I sang that hymn, All that I've needed, these hands have provided. And yet just three short later, years later, I folded those hands, bloodied and nail-pierced, And I cried as I sang that song. All that I needed, these hands provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. And Luke, you've done your research well. You know how this story ends. Gabriel said that he would reign forever and ever. And see, my son, our God... He didn't just die. He defeated death. Those lashes, those thorns, those nails, that cross, his blood, they were just like the birth pains that I experienced before I gave birth and held the joy of life in my hands. Because three days later, when we buried him, my son, your Savior, he rose from the dead. Guys, Luke had to have interviewed Mary. What we get from Luke's gospel in the first and second chapter, he came to save or to seek and to save the lost. There is no greater testimony about how he came than Mary herself. Luke had to have sit down. and Luke tells us in his prologue, Skip taught this last week, that Luke set out as Dr. Luke to give an autopsy of the events. He's going to find the eyewitnesses. He's going to jot this down. It says in the Greek language that he carefully investigated, meaning he talked with the eyewitnesses. He sits down with them, and he finds out what happens. Luke most assuredly would have heard the stories of Jesus' birth. He would have heard what was circulating. In fact, we know that Luke would have had the gospel. He would have had the writings of Matthew and perhaps Mark in his hands. He would have been able to sit down with Matthew, Levi, the disciple, and ask him, do you know about the birth? Luke would have heard all of the stories circulating, even the myths and the legends that began early about his birth. And you see, guys... Myths and legends are born out of ambiguity. When there's confusion and doubts and falsehoods and rumors, that's when legends and myths are bred and not the truth. And you know from last week and what you've read in Luke, Luke's desire for his reader and for us today is that we would be certain, no confusion about what we are reading. So, to get that, Luke sits down with Mary. She would have probably been in her late 70s to early 80s. I believe she lived in Nazareth with all of my informed imagination. When I wrote that, I believe that that's where she would have stayed in Nazareth. There's nothing real evidence that she moved on and lived over in Ephesus like some say. I believe she still lived there. She wasn't heralded as anything else, as just as someone who was a tool in God's hands. She was truly, as she says, the handmaid of the Lord. She tells about how he came like nobody else can say. Look, Mary gives us informed, detailed insider information that no one else could possibly know. Who else can say, and I treasured these things, or she treasured these things in her heart. Who can say that other than Mary? Mary gives us information about the, 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 the events surrounding John's birth in the first chapter. That only Mary could give. We know that because, look, John's dead, Elizabeth's dead, Zachariah's dead. They were older when they had him. So they are all, everyone who knew was dead except for Mary. We know from the scriptures that Mary went to stay with her cousin Elizabeth. So she knew all of the events. She could listen to Zechariah or read as Zechariah wrote on his tablet that when he was inside the Holy of Holies, that the angel appeared to him, here's the detail, on the right side of the altar. 
He could share with her how he felt and how he was fearful when he encountered it. We know that um, from, from Mary's Okay, or for what Mary says, that, that, that Elizabeth says, your baby, or my baby leapt in my womb. Only Mary or someone who was with Elizabeth could know that. We get her insider information that the relatives and the neighbors that were there where Elizabeth and Zechariah lived, they celebrated in the birth of John. We know that because she was there. We know the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Details that only Mary could share that only Luke interviewing her could get from someone who had been there, someone who smelt what it was like in the manger, someone who could see the shepherd, someone who could see what the Magi looked like years later. Only Mary could say these things. Mary's the only one who knew about the Immaculate Conception, right? She's the only one who was present. She's the only one who was present that was privy to the conversation when Gabriel appeared to her and looks at her and says, You, oh, highly favored one. (laughs) And only Mary can know how she felt when he he spoke to her, right? She is a firsthand account that knows these things, and only Mary can give us testimony about it. Luke had to ask her the obvious question. He's a doctor. He knows that it's medically and biologically impossible for a virgin to become pregnant. So he goes, how'd it happen? How'd this happen? Are you just some teenager trying to cover up something? What's going on here? How did a virgin become pregnant? And I think that, can you imagine Mary leaning over and saying, well, when I was down there with Zachariah and Elizabeth, she told me that God told her all things are possible with God. So here we are. It's possible because it happened. You can argue as much as you want, but you can't argue with Mary. She's telling you this is how this happened. God did this. I am pregnant through the Holy Spirit of God. That's how Jesus came to earth. Luke had to ask the obvious question. To, and by the way, look, Mary, only in Luke's gospel do you get the term swaddling. She wrapped the baby in swaddling cloths. That's not in Matthew. You know why? Because in Matthew, that is the account of the birth of Jesus through Joseph's eyes. Men don't make, we don't, we don't care. Right? You know, Mary's like, I wrapped him in these swaddling cloths, and they were so cute. And I wrapped this, and I had little pins. Like she's telling, she knows that. Matthew, Joseph doesn't give details like that, right? Mary's the one who's telling us that I laid him in a manger. Can you imagine, Luke, when she says manger? What do you mean manger? That's a, pig, that's a, that's a feeding trough. What do you mean manger? And she goes, well, there was no room for us in the inn. You know, Joseph would have told the story and complained about not being able to find a place to stay. You know? This is, this is coming from her firsthand. We know that Luke had to have asked the question that we all want to know, that people back then wanted to know, people 100 years later want to know, and that we want to know. What was it like? What was Jesus like when he was a boy? What was it like to raise God? That's a question I want to know. Did he pick on his little brothers? Did he pick on his sisters? You know, we want, we want to know something. And Luke had to ask that. And I love the fact that she gives information. Luke is the only place, is the only gospel writer that we get some information about Jesus' childhood. And I believe that he gives, she gives us, or Luke gives us the information that we need from her. She actually answers the question and she says that on the eighth day, we did what was required. He was circumcised. We brought him, um, um, we, we named him what the angel said, name him. The angel said, name him Jesus. We did what we were supposed to do there. On the 40th day of purification, we brought him back to be purified at the temple. We followed all the customs. And when he was 12, we bring him back to the temple. Now, pause here. We're going to read this story because I want you to see what happens here. But if, imagine... This is not a story I would tell if it was me talking about, you know, I'm, I'm, God gave me his kid to care for. I'm not going to tell this story. Okay, but this is the one that she chose. Of all the stories she could have probably chosen to tell, this is the one that she tells. And look, guys, I understand this. There's a lot of myths, a lot of made-up stories that have been out there for a long time in Christianity about Jesus' childhood. They are all myths and made up. They are not from his mother's mouth like Luke gives us. 
So do not, please, give them any weight whatsoever. They are not scripture. They're made-up legends who have, that have no truth about Jesus in them whatsoever. I think that's why Peter writes to us in 2 Peter and lets us know, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we, were, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's telling you all this stuff that's made up about the way he was born. It's a bunch of baloney. Mary's going to tell us what needs to be told to us, all sufficient for our understanding of Jesus' childhood. And she writes this. Here's, here's what she says. You know, I, I picture her looking across and saying, Luke, let me tell you about the time that I, we took him to the county fair. And here's what happened, son. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. Pause. They left him there. Okay, look, I've babysitted some people before. I've got three kids of my own. I don't know where all three of them are right now. Okay, but I've babysitted some people before. And usually when you keep kids, you want to know where somebody else's kid is, you know. You, you, know, you, you don't care if yours are missing, but you want to find theirs because you've got to return them, you know? But they lose God's son. You know, they don't know where he is. They've left him back there. This is like, like they've left him at the Cleveland County Fair, and they have to go to the water wheel and say, Jesus, please return to the water wheel. Your family's missing you. That's what happens here. It's a, but they do. Now, Paul's. If you want to, if you want to write a story that doctors up Mary a little bit, that makes Mary look like she's a little bit holy, you don't include this. This is not doctor. This is why I wrote my little narrative. Luke is giving us truth. He is giving us what happened, how it happened, by who's giving the testimony, whether it's valid or not in court. This is what happened from. Who witnessed it? It's powerful for us. But I'm not including the story. I pick another one. I pick something that's more flattering to me if I'm married. And I was like, let me tell you about the time I showed him how to throw a baseball. You know, or showed him how to swing a hammer or something like that. And she doesn't. Let me tell you about the time we left him in Jerusalem. Let's pick up the story again. Sorry. I had the side conversation, not in my notes, but I had to say it. Verse 44, his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But the, come on. I would have said, I would have said, it's about a half hour. You know, it was about a half hour and we noticed he was gone. And by the way, they're traveling with family from Nazareth, okay? So they're like saying, he's in the cousin's car. You know, he's riding home with John and Jim, right? John and Jim, maybe I should just John and Jim. But anyway, he's riding home with somebody, okay? <laughs> That's, not, it's, it's a day. They go a day without him. <laughs> Anyways, and they, I get, anyway, okay. They returned to Jerusalem. Then they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. That's when she points to Joseph and all of his hair has been pulled out. You know, it's, it, look, we're in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Or translated, I would be about my father's business. And they did, or they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them to Nazareth. And was submissive to them. And here's the phrase. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. You know, here's why I think Mary includes this one. Here's why I think God includes this story for us. Here's why I believe that it is divinely inspired and placed in our codex for us to read. This is a summary. Jesus' childhood is a summary of Jesus' life. He was about his father's business. This summarizes what he was all about. He's not making pigeons out of clay. He's about his father's business. And anything that we read is, that is anything that is not him being about his father's business is nonsense and does not need to be read. Especially as truth. Okay? 
We get that this is what he was about. And it is encouraging to me to know that this is what we need. This is all we need to know about Jesus' childhood is that he was always about his father's business. And here's what I think. It gives us a glimpse into our lives a little bit, in our lives as followers. Let me ask you something. Have you ever left Jesus Have you ever just felt like I've lost him? Do you need to go looking for him? My prayer today for this and my prayer right now is that if you walk through those doors, that you came looking for him. That many of you in this room, you've lost him a little bit. You left him somewhere along the way. Somewhere along the way in your life. You met him. You've given your heart to him, your life to him perhaps. But you just lost him somewhere. Life just got a little bit too busy. Something else became a little bit more important to you, right? You had to just go do this, and you had, to, you had to pack, and you had to go, and you had to get back home for something else, and you just left him somewhere, right? Maybe you've lost him, and you need to just go looking for him. When I lose things, you know what I do? I try to find them. I lost my keys a few weeks ago. I was, emba- I, couldn't, I, I was trying to time it when I was looking for them because I knew my wife gets home at about 4.20, 4.30. And I was trying to time it so I could, hopefully I could find them and put the house back together because I had made a wreck of it trying to find my keys. My son lost his baseball glove a few weeks ago. I have called everyone but the president. I have called everyone but my congressman. I have called everyone. I have prayed about trying to find that kid's glove. <laughs> Because we lost it, and it was something special to him. Here's the thing. I want you to hear this. You will drop everything for your everything. Have you lost him? Do you need to go looking for him? Just come turn around and go back into town and say, Jesus, Jesus, where are you? I'm sure he'll answer. Ever how many days it was, or half hour, he'll answer. You'll find him. Here's some, uh, I don't want you to feel bad about it, because it happens to the best of people. It happened to Mary and Joseph. I think they're pretty good guys. They're not perfect. They're pretty good people. But it happened to them. It happened to one of my heroes in the faith, Charles Spurgeon. He writes this. It's lengthy, but I want to read it for you. It was just, it's, it's impacted me for years and wanted to read it for you. Do you not remember when you first converted to God and when the young life of your newborn spirit was strong and active, how impetuously you desired to obey God and how intense was your eagerness to serve him in some way or other? I can remember well how I could scarcely abide myself five minutes without doing something for Christ. If I walked the street, I must have a track with me. If I went into the railway carriage, I must drop a track out the window. If I had a moment's leisure, I must be upon my knees or at my Bible. And if I were in the company of someone, I must turn to the, su- turn the subject to the conversation of Christ that I might serve my master. Alas, I must confess, much of that strength of purpose has now departed from me. As I doubt not, it has from many of you with greater prominence have also received diminished zeal. It may be that in the young dawn of life we did, not, we did imprudent things in order to serve the cause of Christ. But I say, give back that time again. Amen. With all of its imprudence and with all of its hastiness, if I might but have the same love to my master, that the the same overwhelming influence in my spirit, making me obey because it was a pleasure to obey my God. Now Christ felt just the same way. He must do it. He must serve God. He must be obedient. He could not help it. He must be about his father's business. Here's some ways that you can get back. Here's some ways you can go looking for him. Number one, three little takeaways. His word. God wrote this. He wrote this to you. Luke 
Guys, you can be confident of every word you read in here, that it's truth, that it's, in, it's given by fallible people, but it is the infallible word of God. Luke's sinful and so is Mary, but God uses sinful people to do his holy work. He can do it through you and he can do it through me. This word is a place where you can encounter him. If you have lost him, I beg you, go back to his word and you'll find him. He will inhabit it. He will be there in your study. He will be there to speak to you and to let you know that, you're, that he is there. Another way is you can pray. Some of you need to do the simple prayer that I just said. You need to fall on your knees and you need to say, Jesus, Jesus, where are you? I've lost you somewhere along the way. It's me that's left. It's not you. But I need you. Oh, he'll show up. He'll show up. His presence will be so thick. And the last way that you can do this is that you can serve. You can serve others. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 that if you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto who? Me. You want to encounter God? You want to go looking for him? He will be in the people that you serve. The poor. The needy. The foster child. The teenager you encounter. God is in the people that we serve. You want to encounter him? Love others. And when you do it to them, it's as if you have done it unto him. That's his words. That's my experience in my life. So when I just get beat down, man, and I've lost him for a little while, and I just start serving. I get in front of people and talk to them and ask him things and see what's going on in their life, and God always shows up. Serve and he'll find him. This is God's business. And wherever you find, wherever you want to go looking, you will always find Jesus doing the Father's business, just like Mary. Guys, we got some little time here. I hope that you understand. That little narrative was from my informed imagination. Okay, that's from me. You're studying this and figuring out, did she go to Nazareth? Did she go to Ephesus? How old would she be? Would she have been alive? Did Luke interview her or not? Is there evidence for that? Yes, there is all over the place. Okay, but here's what I want you to do. When you read the word of God, read it that way. Luke is sitting down with these people. They're giving you details that no one else can give. What you're reading is the truth from the mouths of people like you and me. Many of you could stand up today and testify to what God's done in your life, right? Right? And you can argue all you want to about, about Bibles and codexes and things like that, but we can't argue with what God done in Mary's life. I'm not going to look at her and say, you lied. Right? We're not going to look at Jesus and say, you lied. He was Lord. Right? If you're here today, look. And it's may be, it may be that you're just not looking for him. He's looking for you. You're the one that's lost. You came to the right place. As we were singing, as we were praying, as the Holy Spirit's been preaching, your heart was stirred in you. Your heart was burning with inside of you. That's Jesus calling out your name. Chandler, Chandler, where are you? Donald, Donald, Kenny, Kenny. Where are you? Right? Drawing you to him. Let's pray that God will have his way with us. Jesus most definitely came. Jesus is most definitely seeking. And Jesus will most definitely save. Father, we love you and we thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for, the, for just the countless times in my life. When I have um, heard, felt, believed that who you were, you were who you said you were, as I read your word, I pray, God, for all of us in here that whatever situation we're in, God, that we have come looking for you and that we will continue to look for you, God, because you say in your word that those who seek will find you and that we'll be pleased with what we find. I pray, Lord, for a greater intensity, a, 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 a greater interest in your Bible and in your word. That as we would read through the gospel of Luke, it was as if we pulled up a cup of coffee and we were sitting there with the demoniac. 
And we're sitting there with Jairus and we're sitting there with the woman with the issue of blood. We're sitting there with Mary and we're listening to the testimony of the people that you touched and that you'll use it to touch us. For the glory of Jesus, we pray.